Welcome to the EchoSim Lab located in Scottsdale, Arizona. Today we are in our second day of one-on-one -on -one transesophageal echocardiography training with our 123 sonography student from Seattle, Washington. While versatile in transthoracic echocardiography, she's had essentially no experience with TEE probe manipulation. In this video, she will be guided through a complete exam using our high-fidelity HeartWork simulator. Okay, first view will be metesophageal four chamber view, so let's go ahead and insert the probe. Here's the great vessels, and that'll be usually the first image. We'll look for the left atria. And I'll deepen the field for you a little bit. So let's go ahead and uh, maximize the left atria. So we don't want to be too withdrawn or too inserted. It's okay to have a little bit of five chamber view uh, before you uh, initiate your retroflexion. Good, and let's add in a little bit of retroflexion to extend the left ventricle. And when you do that, you'll cut through a lower uh, longitude, if you will, of the left atria, so you may have to withdraw the probe a little bit to get that maximal left atrial size. Yeah. What do you think? Should I withdraw a little bit here? Just a little bit. Okay. Good. And then at the same time, you might have to add in a little bit more retroflexion. Good. Let me just show you where you're at now. If you look at the uh, external view of the virtual reality, you can see that you're just right through the apex of the heart, and that gives you that perfect non-foreshortened view that you have right now. So at this point, I would go ahead and lock the big wheel okay. to keep that degree of retroflexion. Good. So this is a perfect mid-esophageal four-chamber view. Let's go ahead to the next view, which is the mitral commissure view, usually obtained around 50 degrees. So. Once we center the apex of the heart on the screen, just like you have it right now, and that's important, we'll go ahead and omniplane up to 50 degrees. Good. Then we'll use slight probe rotation to get the true commissure view, uh, where you see the A2 trap door, as some people call it, uh, coming up in the middle of the P1 and P3 scallop. So with rotation of the probe, you'll experiment right and left or clockwise, counterclockwise, until you get the trapdoor look of A2 coming up in the middle of the uh, P1 and P3. Right there, good. Now just quickly, let's show uh, all, the P, all the P scallops, P1 through P3. And you'll have to decide, well, is that a left turn or a right turn? There. Those are all P. Uh, now you've uh, uh, turned a little bit clockwise, so these actually are all A's. This is A1, A2, and A3. But you'll find if you turn the other way towards the left lung, there. These are all the B's. Good. And let's go ahead back to the true commissure view where you're seeing the, the A2 scallop with the P1 and P3 on either side. Nice. Okay, let's uh, proceed on to the next view, which is just this view, but with an additional 40 degrees of omniplane to bring it to 90. So let's come up to 90 degrees of omniplane. Good. And once again, we want to get a non-foreshortened view of the heart with the apex held mobile, immobile. Uh, and to uh, strike the apex, strike through the apex, you use rotation on the pro. And let me once again show you how you've uh, perfectly transected the apex of the heart. I'll tilt it off center here and just zoom in a little bit and rotate through the virtual reality image. Good, so when that insonation plane is going right through the apex, you get a perfectly non-foreshortened view, just like you have now. You have to remember that the right screen's the anterior wall, just like in transthoracic echocardiography. Let's go ahead and proceed on to the uh, long axis view, which is simply this view with an additional uh, 30 degrees or so. So let's start at 120. Let's 
go right to 120. And then use rotation to make sure that the apex of the heart is non-foreshortened. Good. Then you simply glance up at the aortic valve. If it looks good, you're done. If not, add in another five degrees of omniplane. Go back to the apex with your eyes. Make sure that it's non-foreshortened with rotation of the probe. And then glance up at the aortic valve again. If it looks symmetrical and full, then you're done with the view. Perfect. So this is a nice long axis uh, mid-esophageal view. You're looking at the interior leaflet, specifically uh, A2, and you're looking at the posterior le leaflet, specifically P2. Good, let's go to the next view, which is the five chamber view. So let's return to the home view, center up the uh, LVOT, or where you're expecting to see the LVOT appear, which is at the cruise of the heart. And good. Here is the mid esophageal five chamber view. Specifically, we're looking for obstruction in the LVOT. I released it. Oh, was I? That's okay. Let's go ahead and uh, there. Perfect. Maybe just a little bit deeper so that uh, you're getting uh, more uh, uh, robust left ventricle. Good. That's nice. So we'll put a little color here. All we see now is laminar flow towards the probe. So that rules out any obstruction like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, uh, a membrane, SAM, some kind of uh, subaortic ring or tunnel, rules all those things out pretty quickly. This view is also important that it's a segue to the next view, which is the mid-esophageal aortic valve short axis view. So in order to get that view, you want to center the aortic valve in this view first with rotation. And then you have to find that plane in which the uh, uh, tr uh, three cusps of the aortic valve exist uh, in symmetry. And that'll be at 40 degrees. Once you get to 40 degrees, you have to decide if you're just a little bit below the valve, in other words, more apically in the LVOT, or if you're above it. If you're above it, like right there, that means you're in the ascending aorta. When they're just kissing, you're just in the perfect spot. But let's just demonstrate going below the valve a little bit by inserting the probe a little bit. Good. Now you're down in the LVOT. So if you saw this view, you would have to withdraw a little bit out of the LVOT back up to the coaptation level. So let's go ahead and do that. Notice that this is an excellent view to look at the inner atrial septum. And while you're here, you should remember not only to color the uh, aortic valve to look for regurg, or stenosis, but also uh, bring your uh, color box uh, up to the inner atrial septum looking for PFOs and ASDs. Uh, now when you do that, you should drop your color scale down to uh, 20 to 30 per the American Society recommendations. Here we see blue on either side of the inner atrial septum, but uh, there's no color transgressing the septum. So we've effectively, at least in this view, ruled out PFO and ASD. When you're done with uh, the lower Nyquist limit, you have to remember to always elevate it. So let's bring it up 30, 40, 50, 60. And that's so you don't overcall uh, any regurgitation on subsequent views. I'm going to turn off the tower. We're going to go to the next view. The next view is just this view, but with 20 more degrees. We're going to develop the mid-esophageal RV inflow outflow view. So let's go to 60 degrees. And we're looking for a nice symmetric pulmonic valve and an opening tricuspid valve. We can quickly color the tricuspid valve looking for regurg. Don't see any. And then move our color box over to the pulmonic valve looking either for regurg or stenosis. Here there's no regurgitation and only uh, the normal aliasing of uh, uh, forward flow. Good. Next view is just this view but at about 120 to 140 degrees. And the next view we're developing is the mid-esophageal, a beautiful aortic valve long axis view. This view is specifically not to look at the left atria or left ventricle, but to look at the LVOT diameter for our continuity equation, to look at the sinotubular junction diameter and the sinus of valsalva diameter, and to look at the ascending tubular aorta for any uh, uh, aneurysms, dissection flaps, or athromata. Here we don't see any. 
Good, let's develop the next view. The next view is going to be a trip up the ascending aorta. So let's return to zero degrees of omniplane. And simply withdraw the probe and so, until we see the perfect triad of ascending aorta and short axis, main pulmonary artery, and s superior vena cava. So you want to rotate the probe so you see all three clearly. There we go. Maybe even a little bit more rotation just to see this part of the main pulmonary artery right here. There we go. Good. So here is the ascending aorta in short axis. Here's the main pulmonary artery. And this is the RPA. You can tell it's the RPA because it uh, uh, ducks between the probe and the superior vena cava. So uh, it's got to be the right pulmonary artery because of its proximity to the superior vena cava. Good. Now, the next view is simply this view in long axis. Now, if you've obtained the short axis view at zero, you know that the long axis is going to be at 90 degrees of omniplane because it will always be orthogonal to the short axis view. Beautiful. Good. Here's the uh, uh, ascending aorta long axis view, and this is, a, again, a metasophageal view. Here you're seeing the RPA. Now instead of in long axis, it's uh, in short axis. This space right in here is the transverse sinus. This is a normal extension of the pleural space, and it's a completely normal finding. Good. Now let's develop the bicaval view. So the way uh, I'd recommend uh, developing the bicaval view, which by the way is a very easy view to get in TEE, one of the most easy views, is to go to the home view at zero degrees of omniplane and find the uh, level with the left atria, with a nice robust left atria. You're up in the great vessel, so you'll have to push in a little bit. Good. And then you want to find uh, that part of the inner atrial septum that has the fossa ovalis, and you'll know it by, uh, it will be thinner than what you're seeing now, which is uh, the limbus. So you'll use insertion and withdrawal of the probe to find that nice thin fossa ovalis. So just experiment with insertion and withdrawal. There's a nice thin fossa ovalis, which is what we're really going to look for in the next view. Now, to develop the bicaval view, you have to remember to get the omniplane up in the sagittal plane. In other words, the omniplane has to sit in a plane that will recognize the long axis of the inferior and superior vena cava which is at 90 degrees. It's a sagittal plane. Very nice. And hold that right there. And let me just show you where you're at now. You're in a perfect sagittal plane, but the vena cavas are way over here. Mm -hmm. And so you have to recognize that to get over to the cavas, let me just zoom in on it, to get way over here to the cavas, you'll need a hard right turn until you develop both superior and inferior vena cava. So now you're turning right, a little bit more, and you keep going, nice. So there's the superior vena cava, it's on the right screen and the inferior vena cava is on the left screen. And you have a nice thin fossa ovalis surrounded by the superior and inferior limbus. Uh, PFOs will always be at this point here, they're always superior. Um, and uh, the absence of this uh, f fossa ovalis will be uh, a, will cause a secundum type ASD, which is clearly the most common type of ASD. Right up here, we're seeing a little budding of the right upper pulmonary vein. Good. Uh, now let's develop the modified bicaval view, which is simply a uh, turn, and you kind of have to decide which way to turn. Let me just kind of cut into the heart here and show you where you're at right now. Here you are in the bicaval view. Let me just zoom in on this. You can see the insonation plane, which has cut the heart. And uh, you can uh, see that the tricuspid valve is going to be a left or counterclockwise turn, just like you're making now. So now that you've done that, you'll have uh, developed the so-called modified bicaval view, which is right there. This is a uh, good color shot of the tricuspid valve. There's the E and A wave and uh, it's also a good uh, Dopp Doppler shot. Here's a PW Doppler with E and A wave of the tricuspid valve. Good. 
Now let's go on and uh, develop the left atrial appendage view. So let me turn this off and we'll go back to the uh, home view at zero degrees and we'll find a nice uh, full left atrial, uh, left atria, uh, which is centered in the screen. Good. Now the appendage uh, will usually be found between 45 and 90 degrees. So you can quickly omniplane up to 45 degrees and then slowly advance until you uh, develop a nice full appendage. You don't really want to uh, turn the probe or uh, advance the probe, but rather just advance the omniplane. Oh, okay. okay. And um, I refer to this as growing the appendage with the omniplane. Maybe a little bit more, see how it's more robust. Mm -hmm. Then when you think you have it full, then to even make it fuller, you can scan left and right to make sure that you're on the uh, uh, largest volume of the left atrial appendage. Also, you're inspecting it for clot. Instead of cutting a single plane, you're cutting an infinite number of planes looking for a sludge or clot, both of which can cause a stroke and cardioversion or cryoablation. Good. And uh, remember that uh, in this view, usually you'll see the Coumadin ridge in the left upper pulmonary vein. You won't have to go look for it. But if you do, remember that it's a little bit more dorsal. Uh, it's a little bit more posterior, so that'll involve a little bit of a left turn, a uh, counterclockwise turn, and you might have to withdraw the probe just a little bit. I'll try and really open it up with a little bit more turn. Good, that's nice. Maybe open a it a little bit more. Good, perfect. And here's the Coumadin ridge right here, and above it will always be the left upper pulmonary vein. And let me just show you the color pattern of the left upper pulmonary vein. I'll put a little bit of color on it. Let me turn off the PW here for a second and drag the color across it. It has a very characteristic color pattern. It's red, red, light blue. Red, red, light blue. Uh, the two reds are the S and the D wave, and the light blue is the AR wave. Just as long as we're here, let me just PW that to show it to you. And uh, these become very important in determining uh, what kind of pathology you're looking at be it mitral regurge or some grade of diastolic dysfunction. Um, and uh, here's the typical uh, pattern. Here we see S1 and S2 wave, a D wave, and the flow away from the probe is the AR wave. So uh, beautifully done. Let me turn this off. Now we're going to go down into the stomach. So to go to the stomach, I'd return to zero degrees of omniplane. And follow the left ventricle down, trying never to lose the left ventricle. There's the coronary sinus. Let's just stop there for a second. This illustrates the junction between the distal esophagus and the stomach. So it's uh, when you see this uh, coronary sinus here emptying into the right uh, atria, uh, that's an indicator that you're at the gastroesophageal junction. Now, let's go ahead and push gently further to enter the stomach. And uh, I like to go to the home view of the stomach, or what I call the home view of the stomach, which is the mid short axis view. So the full name of this view is the transgastric mid, because it's at the level of the papillary muscle, short axis view. Let me just change the depth of the field to be more appropriate for the image uh, size. Good. Remember that this is the inferior wall next to the probe. The probe is sitting in the stomach looking back up through the diaphragm at the heart. The heart lays on its inferior wall. So uh, that wall closest to the probe is the inferior wall. So once you know that that's the inferior wall, you know the wall across from its anterior. And this wall dividing the RV from the LV, well that's got to be the septal wall. And opposite the septal wall is always the lateral wall. Good. Now let's develop the next view, which uh, is uh, an easy view to get from here. It's simply pushing the probe in until the papillary muscles disappear. Good. Now we're at the apical short axis view. Full name is transgastric apical short axis view. Now let's withdraw it back to the base to get the basal short axis view. And this might involve a little bit of uh, anaflexion uh, to uh, just uh, define the tips of the mitral valve where it's co-opting. 
this bit, this image is a little bit uh, oblique because in the far field you're seeing papillary muscles here mm -hmm. and in the near field you're kind of at the right level. So let's introduce a little bit more uh, anaflexion. Now at the same time please recognize that you're seeing coronary sinus. So that means that you're still in the esophagus and you need to introduce the probe a couple of centimeters further uh, with some uh, pushing of the probe at the bite block. A little bit further until you really lose that coronary sinus. Good. Now you're in the stomach. Now, uh, this is still an oblique cut, so let's introduce a little bit more anaflexion with the big wheel. Good. Now you're seeing uh, a little bit here in the, uh, at the A2, you're seeing the actual uh, cuss or scallops of the mitral valve. So let's just do a little bit more anaflexion. Not that much. That's pretty good, that's nice. So this is the basal short axis view, still called a transgastric view. The anterior leaflet's on the left screen, the posterior leaflet's on the right screen. Good, now let's go uh, back to the uh, mid short axis view and develop the derivative views. So back down to the papillary muscles, good. Now, uh, we're going to get the two-chamber view, which is simply this view with the LV well-centered and uh, with an omniplane of 90 degrees. So this is a short axis view. We're going to look at the two-chamber view, which is the long axis of the left ventricle. So we go to 90 degrees. We go from zero to 90 degrees. And then we just uh, play with the rotation of the probe a little bit to develop these nice, fine chordae tendineae. That's beautiful, and it leaves you with a nice wide open left ventricle. The apex is not part of this view. This is a great view for looking at the inferior wall close to the probe and the interior wall distal to the probe. And it's a very good view for looking at the chordae on FOSS. You might want to just tweak the rotation a little bit to light up those chordae. Here they come, there they are. Very nice, you can see both the primary chordae going to the tips and the secondary going to the underbody of the mitral valve leaflets. Now the next view is uh, based on this view and it's the RV, it's the RV inflow view. And to get that, you simply have to rotate the probe over to the right heart. Well, that's gonna be a right turn. And um, you can tell you're in the RV because the wall becomes so thin. Remember that the upper normal of uh, uh, wall thickness for the RV is five millimeters. Good, that's beautiful. So transgastric RV inflow view. Very similar to the uh, TTE uh, parasternal RV inflow view. Now let's go back to the two chamber view to develop the subsequent view. Good. Now the next view is the transgastric long axis view. It is basically a Doppler view of the LVOT and the aortic valve. To develop that, you start with this two chamber view and you slowly omniplane from 90 up to 120. And as soon as you start to think you see the aortic valve, LVOT and sending aorta, be it on screen or off screen, you, you stop. And then uh, we can kind of appreciate that you do have a nice aortic valve, but it's mostly off the screen. Mm -hmm. So in order to get it on the screen, uh, at this point, I would pull the probe out a little bit and turn right. And all you want to do is bring it just on screen and just on screen, because that is actually the perfect Doppler angle. The closer this is to the right edge of the screen, the better the Doppler angle. If you were to manipulate this in image to bring it to center screen, that would be a, a less favorable Doppler angle. Good. Let's go to the next view, which is an interesting view. It's the transgastric RV basal view. So let's go back to the short axis, mid uh, papillary view, by going to zero degrees of omniplane. Good. And for this view, we kind of want to be high on the papillary muscles to where they almost start to turn into chordae a little bit. Yeah, I think that's nice. Now show yourself all of the RV, bring the RV to center screen with rotation of the probe. It'll be right rotation because the RV is on the right side of the patient. So right rotation is also called clockwise rotation. Now you're seeing the chordae and maybe the tips of the papillary muscles 
of the tricuspid valve, but we want to anaflex our way up towards the base of the heart. Good. A little bit more. Now we're in the cordae going to, now we're in the uh, uh, tips of the tricuspid leaflet. They're coapting. And this nicely illustrates the uh, septal leaflet uh, attached to the septum. Uh, inferiorly, here next to the probe, that's called the posterior leaflet. And then right across from it, of course, is the anterior leaflet. It's the biggest of the three leaflets. Good. Let's uh, skip on here to the deep transgastric view. So let's go back to the mid papillary view, center of the left ventricle, and let's push the probe in until we uh, don't see any more of the left ventricular cavity, until the cavity abolishes. And then let's push a little bit further until the myocardium completely goes away. Then let's back off the probe three centimeters and push our fingers towards the bite block. So we've gone past the apex of the heart now by exactly three centimeters, that distance between your fingers and the bite block when you started to push. Now you have to do a hard anaflexion to look back at the heart. Because you've gone past it, you have to look back at it. So let's bring in a hard anaflexion. And here comes the um, left ventricle. And I'll deepen a little bit of the field a little bit. And uh, we're trying to find that plane right here where we get a good clean Doppler shot at the LVOT and the aortic valve cusps for uh, doing quantitation of either stroke volume or um, aortic uh, valve uh, areas. Good, very nice. Okay, now let's progress on to our aortic pullout. So uh, let's go ahead and come back uh, to zero degrees where you're at already and pull back into the uh, thorax and I'd come all the way up to uh, the five chamber view. Good, there's the junction. Here's the five chamber view. Now you have to decide where the descending thoracic aorta is. Well, it's in the left chest behind the left lung. So that means you have to do a hard rotation of the uh, probe handle to uh, drive the um, uh, crystal to the uh, the image to the left chest behind the left lung. Good. That started out as a right turn, but then you realize yeah. that while well, the vena <laughs> cave is over in the right side, the aorta is over in the left side, so you reversed it nicely. Here's the mid-esophageal uh, uh, aorta in short axis. Now you want to develop the long axis view. So if the short axis is at zero, uh, go ahead and um, uh, develop the long axis. You know it's going to be at 90 degrees vomi plane. And you may want to just insert the probe a little bit because I think you kind of got it a little bit towards the arch. Nice, good. That's perfect. And this is the long axis of the descending thoracic aorta. This is the view in which you do a PW of the uh, flow uh, coming down the aorta. Remember the, the patient's head is on the right screen and the patient's feet ca uh, caught at its left screen. So the systolic flow with the PW cursor placed closer to the right screen uh, will show the systolic flow above the baseline as uh, illustrated here. Let me just drop the baseline a, uh, a centimeter two. Good. Uh, please note that uh, right here is diastolic flow reversal. This is funny because this is flow actually turning around and uh, going back towards the head, and that comes from the elastance of the aorta. During systole, the aorta uh, builds up uh, some capacitance through its own elastance, and uh, when the aortic valve closes, that elastance collapses the aorta, drives a lot of blood peripherally towards the uh, uh, feet, but it drives a lot of blood also approximately towards the uh, neck and perfuses uh, the great vessels. It's called the Winkessel effect. Good. Now let's go back to short axis. I'll turn off the PW for you. And uh, center the uh, aorta, the descending aorta in short axis. And then carefully withdraw the uh, probe, inspecting the aorta as you go along. The aorta is going to want to try and get off screen because it changes its position relative to the esophagus. They call that the setting sun. And you keep pulling, and as soon as you feel the aorta start to blossom out, 
uh, into the arch, then the idea is to kind of just pull a little bit further and then stop. And uh, if you kept pulling here, you're very high in the esophagus, so you pull out of the upper esophageal sphincter. Here, you want to rotate the probe to illustrate the maximum amount of the aortic arch, just like that. That's the exact angle to uh, illustrate uh, the um, largest amount of arch uh, uh, that you can get on screen one, at one time. You might want to reduce this space here a little bit. Yes, nice. So this is one of the only two upper esophageal views. So the full name of this view is upper esophageal aortic arch long axis, clearly a long axis view. Then the last view is just this view, but in short axis. So if we're at zero degrees for this view, then to get the short axis view, we'd simply change from zero to 90 degrees. Good, now we see at the top of the screen, that's the uh, aortic arch in short axis. And to uh, clarify the view, to make it complete, we want to rotate the probe so that we strike an insonation plane through the pulmonic valve in the RVOT, right there. Beautiful. So that completes the exam. Very nicely done. Very, very nice. Good.